Have you ever looked at the beauty and intricacies of an animal, bird, or fish? And ask yourself, could this really have been created through a process of evolution? Could time plus chance come together and give us all the beauty we see in the world? Hi, I'm David Hames, and in the next few minutes, we're going to take a close look at some animals that are going to shatter that very idea. I want to introduce you to Dr. Job Martin. Dr. Martin has had a very interesting background. He's been a college professor and a dentist. He even served on the dental crew for President Johnson's Air Force One and the Presidential Fleet. But for the past 20 years, Dr. Martin has been lecturing students on incredible creatures that defy evolution. But it wasn't always this way. Dr. Martin, out of a scientific and medical background, once believed in the theory of evolution. Evolution, as I was taught, it all started with a thing called the Big Bang. They say this Big Bang went kaboom and shot out hydrogen gas mostly, and the gas somehow turned to dust, and the dust condensed down into planet Earth. The evolutionists say it started dry, and then over millions of years, volcanic activity produced the water, and then in some little pond of this water somewhere on planet Earth, uh, these inorganic chemicals got together and they were zapped by some kind of x-ray or something else and all of a sudden you have this little speck of life and they say that was about three and a half billion years ago and then that little speck of life somehow over about three billion years became the first cell which was somewhere around 600 million years ago and then that progressively became beautiful you. Dr. Martin's traditional scientific background would go through an evolution, rather a revolution as he joined the staff as a professor at Baylor Dental College. This was the beginning of the evolution of a creationist. And so in the fall of 1971, I went to Baylor in Dallas and gave my first lecture. It was on the evolution of the tooth. And I talked about how these fish scales gradually migrated into the mouth and became teeth. And a couple of my students came to me after class that day and said, Dr. Martin, have you ever investigated the claims of creation science? Well, that was 1971. I'd never even heard of it. At that point, I'd been a Christian for about five years. And uh, so I'm thinking to myself, where are these guys coming from? Uh, I've never heard of this. And uh, so I said, sure, I'll look into this with you. And I'm thinking, kind of as a cocky young professor, I'll blow these guys away. Well, they asked me to start studying the assumptions that the evolutionists make. And in all my years, eight years of scientific education, I had never had a single professor tell me about an assumption. And uh, so we started looking at the assumptions, and I began to realize they're making some claims here that really the assumptions aren't valid when they tell us rocks are very old and all these kinds of things. And, uh, and then they asked me to start studying some animals and see if I thought that animal could evolve. Well, the first thing that we really studied together was this little bug called a bombardier beetle. And this little insect, it's about a half inch long, and it mixes chemicals that explode. So I began to think, okay, now how would that evolve? Let's say if evolution is true, and you're evolving along here, and you don't have a defense mechanism, because that is the defense mechanism of the bug. So if evolution is true, it had to somehow evolve that. So let's say it's coming along here. Well, the first time it evolves the, the explosion, what does it do to the bug? Boom, you just splattered your bug, okay? So splattered bug pieces don't evolve. So I thought, well, how, how, how could this have happened? Well, it doesn't blow itself up. It has another little factory inside itself that manufactures chemicals, a chemical, acts as a catalyst, so that when you squirt that chemical in with these other chemicals that are like in neutral, you get your explosion. Well, the first time it manufactured that little chemical, it, it, here it goes again, blew itself up again. But it doesn't, why? Well, because it has like an asbestos-lined firing chamber. And even then it would blow itself up if it didn't have somewhere for the explosion to go. So it has uh, like twin tail tubes. And it can aim these tail tubes all the way up, out the side, out the front. Let's say a spider is coming up toward its side and it doesn't have time to turn around and shoot. Uh, it can just take its little gun turret, and aim it out there and shoot. The, the explosion on this little bug, all you hear, if, if you're listening as a human, you hear this pop. 
But scientists have now put that explosion in slow motion. And it's like, it's like about a thousand sequential little explosions, but they're so fast, all we hear is one pop. And so you think, well, now, why would that be? Well, that was a curious thing for the scientists that study this little bug. A lot of them at Cornell University, some other places. And what they discovered was that if it was just one big pop, the, the little bug, if he's shooting like a spider, let's say over here, uh, and he goes room bang and shoots it, he's gonna pop himself right out of there. It's like lighting a burner on a jet engine, and so he's out of there. But as long as it is a sequential explosion with his little legs, he can hang on. How would evolution explain a sequential explosion? This little bug messes with all the theories of evolution. There is no way a slow, gradual process is going to produce this bug. There's no way uh, even the newest theories of evolution, like punctuated equilibria, which means evolution happens very fast. Well, there's no way that will explain this little bug. I began to realize, how could this particular little animal, for instance, evolve? Uh, it needed all of its parts. It needed everything there all at once, or you just don't have the animal. And my stomach started to churn. If, if I really want to be honest, and my wife would tell you, my stomach churned for five years. It took a five-year struggle for me to begin to flip the way I think, from thinking in an evolutionary way to thinking in more this animal or little creature, little bug, whatever, was created uh, fully formed, just like it is, because that went against everything I'd ever learned. Did you know the world's strongest animal is actually the beetle? In fact, in one test, the rhinoceros beetle carried over 850 times its own weight on its back. That would be like me trying to carry 130,000 pounds. I don't think so. Now let's take a look at the world's tallest animal. A bull giraffe is about 18 feet tall. In order to get blood up that long skinny neck against gravity, the bull giraffe has to have a powerful pump and that's his heart. And the heart of a bull giraffe can be as much as two and a half feet long. Big, powerful pump. Now, as he's going along here, living his life, everything's just fine, but all of a sudden, this 18 foot tall creature decides, I need a drink of water. So he bends his head down to get a drink of water. Now we have a problem. Because now this powerful pump, instead of pumping against gravity, is pumping with gravity. And so the heart gives a mighty squeeze and the blood shoots down his neck, hits his brain and bursts his brain. And so now he just blew his brains out, okay? So he's dying and he must be thinking to himself, I need to evolve something here to take care of my problem. When I get a drink of water, I blow my brains out. Of course, we know dead creatures don't evolve, but he doesn't blow his brains out because as he bends his head down, there are like little spigots in his artery that goes up the neck, little valves, and they close. But the last pump is beyond the last valve. And so it's enough to burst the little arterioles in his brain, but it doesn't go into his brain. The last pump kind of goes whoop underneath the brain into like a sponge. And this sponge just gently expands and he hasn't blown his brains out and he gets his drink of water. And now he sees a zebra kind of running up from this side and he just ignores it. But he sees a lion coming up from this side. Oh, the lion wants to eat me, I gotta get out of here. Now, how does he know the difference, by the way? Evolutionists can't explain that to us, but the fact is, here comes this lion. He's going to eat the giraffe, and so the giraffe uh, jumps up. He runs about five steps, passes out. Not enough oxygen to his brain. While he's there, passed out, the lion is eating him. Uh, he must be thinking, I, I need to evolve something here. I got this problem. I pass out when I get up too fast. And, but he doesn't, of course. Well, why? Well, because God made him so that when he begins to bring his head up, the little spigots, the little valves in the artery uh, open, the sponge under the brain gently squeezes that last little pump of oxygenated blood up into his brain. There are little valves in the vein that goes down the neck. They close, and by the time he's up and running, everything is fine, his blood pressure is fine, and he does just fine. Well, how would that evolve? He needs all of those parts, all there, all at the same time, all at once, or he's dead. And so I think the giraffe is another example of a designer. He needed a designer to design him just like he is. The tallest giraffe known was named George. He resided at the Chester Zoo in England. George was 20 feet tall to the tips of his horns, which are actually called ossicones. Here's another interesting giraffe fact.